fun. Like it's crazy how like later you just find out who's using what and uh, all of a sudden you'll just hear, oh, I love your book. I just found out that a uh, homeless ministry has been using it. And that was really, that, that was, was rad. Really cool. mm -hmm. That was awesome. Yeah. Was yeah. Book. So we can. It was a cool book. Here, right? What's that? We can curse on here, right? You can, <laughs> and we are alive. So you're allowed to do whatever you right feel now. the wow. Holy Spirit leads you to we're do. Uh, right now. And I would encourage, actually, Russ, Rachel, Holy Sarah, Spirit. and Matt, if you guys feel so compelled uh, to share this onto your own Facebook pages so we can spread it out if you guys feel so compelled uh, to do that as we're waiting to gather right, folk. Yeah. Uh, if you go onto my Facebook page, you can push it out onto yours. Look at me learning, guys. I just got a new computer, too. Um, I can hear one of you listening to it. It's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Confession is good for the soul. <laughs> I mean, I <laughs> wait, okay, so here we are. How do I push it out, guys? I just did it on my phone, so it was easier. Perfect. Oh, well, I just, smart. I think, set it up. So now, look at that. All of our friends are able to join in in the comments. And so we'll be able to see people. We got Hi, Pastor Rachel coming in here. And so we got people throwing up comments saying, hey. And so uh, this will be good. We got Sweet Hat Matt going in there. And so this is this is, this is is good. I like that. Um, and... So uh, can I talk yeah. about something really funny about the 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 name of this little hot <laughs> <laughs> So Danny and I got into a conversation about the name. Um, Sarah, you and I had a few pictures or a few comments that people posted about our pictures. Um, and so oh, I missed this. I missed <laughs> all of this. <laughs> well, I took him down quick. <laughs> And so, and what, then what, I, what I were the it. comments? We well, have to know we'll get back to these that. comments. And so I told my husband, right. I was like, oh, I wonder why people are commenting this. And so I showed my husband the bio with like hot thoughts and my smiling picture. And he was like, Rachel, anytime a smiling woman is posted near hot thoughts, Ooh. maybe, just maybe, it's not the audience that you're looking for. True. I mean, where it is. <laughs> I mean, we all need. Yeah. That's right. And then, like, well, just... we were having this. Di this was dinner conversation at the Billups family table, you know. And so, my high schooler, who's officially a high schooler today, looked at me when I said hot thoughts, and she just bust out laughing. Like, can you really, mom? No way. No way. Are you talking mm -hmm. about? So, uh, Danny. Well, I will say, I will say <laughs> the straight white man ignorance strikes again to come up with names that just don't, <laughs> that don't work. Don't I work. Think it's good. I think it's good because like it causes people to pause and think. Yeah. It's evocative, yeah. right? It is. Uh, I mean, it's worth the name. You post a my picture. And I've got all kinds of people calling me now, so I love it. <laughs> 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 uh, way to be we're oh. just, you know we're just helping each other out like hey. for our target audience you know yeah. you gotta get name yes. name. Yes. i think mm -hmm. everybody who's watching you should give danny a name that you think this should be called you know like just keep him coming that idea. way <laughs> that way yeah, you know he has all kinds of he's crowdsourcing the name we are crowdsourcing it i'm with <laughs> yeah. that so well hey clever. Would we you say, are, uh, I thought it was clever. Go ahead. Because it rhymes. That's what you're going to say, Sarah. That was it. I just thought it was clever. That was it. That's all I have. <laughs> Period. Well, I appreciate, I appreciate that. Well, hey, I think we're kind of at our critical mass to start things out. And so uh, not everyone knows all of you, but some of them know some of you. And so why don't we just get a chance to introduce ourselves? And so, Rachel, why don't we start with you? Matt, we'll end with you. And we'll just kind of go through some introductions, who you are, what you do, and why you care about the conversation of the future of the church. Yeah, so I'm uh, Rachel Billups. I pastor uh, a church in the booming metropolis of Tip City, Ohio called Ginghamsburg Church. And uh, oh my goodness, what an incredible place to be pastor. Uh, it's, a pla it's a place where people uh, love Jesus and do something about it. So I just love, uh, love being a pastor here. Uh, I'm married to my high school sweetheart. Uh, we've been married almost 19 years, which is hard to believe. And I got four kiddos ranging from three to 14. So two boys, two girls, full house. 
And uh, I love being part of this conversation, mostly because I want to hear what everybody else has to say, because my, uh, my ears are open, because I think it's a whole new world when it comes to the church. And there is something very exciting to me about that. Cool. Yeah, Sarah. Hi, I am Sarah Heath, and I am in Costa Mesa, California, where I pastor a church that was dying um, like size-wise. So about five years ago, I was uh, sent here after having done um, about 10 years in ministry elsewhere. And so I am the lead pastor as we've done a restart and revitalization. So I love uh, the idea of thinking about why church. Um, I also do a lot of um, restoring, restoration work, like HGTV style. I love to flip churches, both the community and the culture, but also the building. So um, that's why I care because we have all these big, beautiful buildings. And why do we have them if they're not um, helping to serve the city and helping to serve people and also helping people once we can gather, I feel like it's a really important space for people to meet people who are different than them. Cause I think we've gotten so bipartisan as a culture. And so church right. can be, if done well, the place where that conversation changes. So mm -hmm. that is kind of why I'm interested in the conversation. Cause I don't really like the just church for church sake. And that doesn't work for me. So, and it definitely doesn't work for my folks. So I do a lot of yeah. kind of reclaiming what all of these things mean and helping people think through it. So I'm excited to hear your thoughts too. I'll be excited to hear. Cool. Russ, what's up with you, man? Uh, yeah, uh, Russ Johnson uh, in Florida right now, Fort Myers. Been down here for about six years. Uh, lead an organization called the Table Network. Table Network was uh, probably at its core, probably the best way to describe it is we're just a, a movement of people that are just recentering spirituality around tables. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, I lead that with my wife, Krista. We've been married coming up on 22 years. We too uh, were high school sweethearts. Uh, we got three kiddos that range. Our oldest is about to turn 22. My daughter Emily just graduated. She's almost 19. And our youngest, Eli, Mr. Surprise, uh, just turned three. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> he, is, uh, yeah. he definitely is a surprise. But uh, we're loving it. Yeah, we're loving it. And why am I in this conversation? Why do I love this conversation? I would probably say because I just have a real heart for uh, what Alan Hirsch refers to as the 70% of society that has no interest in what mm. has become church. So my yeah. story started as somebody who was never going to come to your church service, period. I uh, became a believer as an adult. Uh, my girlfriend is now my wife as well. And I think our story, you know, going into ministry from that platform has always just been for people that are outside and uninterested. Mm. So when I hear like future of the church and what could it be and where will it go? And I'm like, hey, I'm in. Mm. That's awesome. Cool. Thanks, Russ. Yeah. Uh, Matt, what about you, man? My name is Matt Miofsky. I pastor a church in the city of St. Louis called The Gathering uh, that I actually started about 13 years ago. So I've been in one place a long time, really uh, my whole adult life right here in St. Louis. And before that, I was born and raised here anyway. So I, I you know, I love being in a place long enough to really feel like you get to know it. And so uh, that's what I love about being in St. Louis. Um, you know why I'm here? I guess there's a couple of reasons. I, you know, the longer I do this, the less I feel like I know about mm -hmm. how to do church or what I'm doing. So uh, when I get to participate in things like this, you know, I'm only going to talk one fifth of the amount of time. So I get to learn four fifths of the time, which I need because just the longer I do it, the, the less certain I am about um, what the church is or what it's going to look like in the future. So that means for me, kind of a humility of, of needing to learn. And then I think uh, secondly, I, you know, without being cliche about it, Jesus really did save my life at a point in time when I think my life could have taken a, a couple of different directions probably ones that wouldn't have been good for me. And I've just always had a deep belief that uh, that Jesus can change the lives of other people as well, but the church has oftentimes gotten in its own way. And so early in my ministry, I just really had a passion for sharing Jesus with people, especially people who uh, maybe have been told that they don't belong, have been burned or bored by the church. Uh, or for whatever reason, have encountered stumbling blocks when it comes to to Jesus. And so I've tried to pursue that mission 
Uh, at times it's gotten me into trouble, but I, I, I wear those as badges of honor because I, I just deeply believe that uh, Jesus is for all people. And this is probably the, the biggest mark where the church has gotten it wrong uh, a lot of times in the past. So I'm just trying to do a small part in, in correcting that. Cool. Well, hey, with that, what we're going to do uh, is we're going to dive in. Uh, and for the uninitiated, uh, what this looks like now that everyone has met you is we have sauces that we get to eat while we talk about uh, some spicy questions. And so maybe five seconds a piece, uh, what sauce you have. Uh, and I've got myself Aka Miso, great sauce. If you don't know, you maybe don't know yours. Mine's 116,000 Scoville units. Very hot to start out. Uh, but Rachel, what do you have for number one? For number one, I'm going to go from like mild oat. And I've got yeah. just, uh, Frank's Red Hot. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Sarah? Um, so I ordered my wings from Wingnuts. And I, I was an idiot because I got their hot wings. <laughs> so I'm starting at a level that like prepare to just watch <laughs> me be red. Just like turn red. <laughs> so I don't even know what this is. But it already hurts my nose to smell it. So. Well, that's that's what Hot Thoughts as a show has always wanted someone to start out with. So I'm happy that you're doing that. Uh, Russ, what do you have as number one? And I'm I'm uh, I'm running with that Frank's that Frank's Red right. Hot with some butter. <laughs> I love it. And Miaski, what do you got? All right, Danny, I got some wings from uh, Weber's Front Row right here. And yeah, so you I'm did. going with their hot sauce to start, and then I've got four to excel from there. I love it. Weber's has underrated but very delicious wings, not far from my house or yours. Yeah, they're good. So. We ordered, we actually ordered 50 of them tonight for dinner at my <laughs> house, and I had to save five. So. I love that. Well, hey, we I will throw up the question. Uh, so feel free to douse your wing, take a bite. Uh, and then Rachel, why don't you kick us off with the answer? Uh, and, and the question is this, I, at least in my church, we're excited about the future, but we have a lot of like lament and pain about what we miss. And so I just wonder, as you as a leader and pastor, like what do you guys miss the most about church as we knew it, church pre-COVID? So I'm, am I supposed to eat first or talk first? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would. I would probably take a bite and then talk, but because okay. everyone's biting, why don't you talk? Yeah, there you go. You dive in there. Mm -hmm. Where? <laughs> table, half eating, half talking all the time. Um, so there are a couple of things that I really miss. Um, about the church that isn't a very churchy kind of thing. Um, Russ, when you said um, you were part of the table organization, my heart just leaped uh, because when uh, COVID hit, we were in the middle of a series called The Table Jesus Eats With Everyone. And really it's just kind of the, the my personal heart and the heart of our church. And we do something and have for the last, um, I guess it's been five years called Open Table at our home. Uh, we just put it out there. We started inviting people, strangers, neighbors, friends, acquaintances. And um, at first we were doing it every week and we decided that was crazy because 50 people would show up. And um, so we started doing it once a month and we, uh, until COVID hit, we were doing it once a month where uh, I just put out a big, massive Facebook invite and people can invite anybody they want to invite. And the kind of eclectic group that forms, whether there's 20 people or 75 people in my house, people bring in things, we pray together. It's not a super churchy atmosphere, but we just really hang out with one another and get to know one another. And so um, there have been moments where it has been the front door to our church and mm -hmm. uh, it brings so much joy to my life and I'm an extreme extrovert. And so I don't have as many people. I mean, I got six, <laughs> six, a family of six, but um, I just miss seeing people, meeting new people through open table. And then a really strange thing happened during COVID. I don't do a lot of um, uh, pastoral care when it comes to like funerals or hospitals. We are a big church, so I'm not usually like the primary person, uh, but we mm -hmm. had a, a young dad that had cancer um, and I was, I'm pretty close to the family and uh, he died within the first few weeks of COVID. And I had to pray for him and his family over the phone. and. Uh, I know it was meaningful to them and it's fine, but it sucked. 
um, it sucked to not be in in that room to be present, the yeah. mystery of presence. And so um, I'm still grieving that. I'm still grieving that. Yeah. Thanks, Rachel. That was great. Thank you for kicking us off with that. Yeah. Um, Sarah, what about you? I, I know probably for you, there's things that you miss as well. So like what's been hard for you kind of in this transition? I do miss my um, people, but I also miss it's um, transitioned a little bit, but we do this thing called Theology on Tap, which is um, mm -hmm. we gather at local breweries and um, whether you drink or not, uh, we just, there's all these great breweries here that have outdoor seating and um, it has become this incredible conversation. And I love it because I just bring questions and quotes and then they go to town. Our, our community is a little unique where we have a lot of folks who, um, kind of the nuns and duns. So we have a lot of folks who actually were pastors yeah. at one point and have left. And a lot of folks who have Bible degrees, a lot of people who um, kind of deconstructed their faith and are in a process of reconstructing. So it is my absolute favorite thing to sit and listen to them talk. And I miss that. It's uh, those nights are yeah. so meaningful to me. And even like we've had a couple of bartenders ask for the sheets. One guy was like, I used to be a Christian. Can I have that? And like was really into it. And he's like, I think I would still be involved if this was the kind of thing that I saw more often. So I miss mm -hmm. that a lot. I miss um, Sunday mornings in that I miss some of our uh, older folks that I don't get to see online because that's not a, a thing that they do. So I miss the presence of that for sure. Um, but yeah, I think it's the, I miss the people a lot. Yeah, that, uh... I resonate with that a lot. I think we hear a lot about that. Like I, like I would come to church if it existed like that. And now it's like, we kind of don't have the opportunity to go to some of those spaces. And I know Russ for you, like that was a big thing you were doing. Like the table network is kind of the church where, uh, wherever people are. And so what has it been like for yeah. you kind of trying to navigate that? Uh, it's been rough for sure. Um, I would just, you know, concur with what's already been said. It just comes down to people. You know, at the end of the day, that's that's what you miss. Our our house is, you know, filled with a lot of people on Sunday evenings. And of course, you know, we go to other people's homes and man, just getting around a table, laughing, eating, mm -hmm. sharing, right? Crying, whatever, whatever, right. whatever happens, happens. And just to be there with people in that space, whether they're kicking the tires of Christianity or they've walked away, they got burnt, right? They got burnt out. Um or maybe they're just, you know, fired up about everything, which is pretty rare. But uh, yeah, I would say that the people, the people element for sure. And especially like out in just the city where I live, mm. uh, I don't have an office. So I move around a lot and finally landed on a bar here locally that I love. Got to know the staff and uh, the owner. And they basically gave me a seat at the bar and the secret Wi-Fi code. And that's where I work. <laughs> And we have lots of it's great awesome. conversations all day long. So um, yeah, I, great. I, I miss that like thoroughly. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Well, Matt, what about you? I know the, the gathering is a rapidly changing, innovative church, but I know there's got to be something that is hard to, to have to leave behind, even when things rapidly change. So what's it been like for you? Yeah. You know, I, there's a few things I've found that I miss. A few of them have surprised me. Um, we have these moments in worship that are just very incarnational. We hold hands together every time we do the Lord's Prayer. And it's gotten to be, you know, a big congregation. But that that holding of hands is something that I really miss. And, you know, may, maybe a long time before it ever comes back. So I just think about that a lot as I'm praying the Lord's Prayer. Powerful prayer to pray alone really powerful to pray it kind of in solidarity with just hundreds and hundreds of people. And um, I miss that. I miss the vision of that along with serving people communion, which personally as a pastor is my probably the most rewarding part of ministry week in and week out for me. It's just, I love looking in people's eyes and you can tell so much. I can tell so much without us even sharing words, you know, just yeah. people coming forward, smiling, yawning, crying, <laughs> looking distressed. And, and I get to see, you know, again, just hundreds of people come through that communion line and, and I have the honor of getting to, to serve them. And I miss that. I really, I really miss both of those things a lot. And I think just more broadly, 
I didn't realize, I guess, how much energy I got from all the nonverbal ways that we communicate with each other. Mm-hmm. Just the head nods, the look into your eye, facial expressions, a handshake, a hug, you know, all those ways. And as a person who does a lot of communicating, uh, staring into a, you know, just a camera all the time and not having any of those uh, nonverbal forms of communication, I, I really miss miss those. I find myself craving just actual human interaction. So uh, that's it for me. That preaching, guys, that preaching to a camera life. It's, uh, I finally had to, I ended up just saying, look, this is going to be like it would be in person. Like, I'm going to do it in one take. Yeah. I say a word weird if I like, whatever it might be. But otherwise, it just, it feels so inauthentic to like, you know, to, I think there's a reason why we should be in proximity to people that we're speaking with. Um, because I think there's, you know, culture, there's this death of an expert. People don't come just because like, you are going to give them all the knowledge. It's the it's the relationship piece, and that's gone, and that's hard. Um, and so I always have to sort of figure out how to talk specifically to people, like certain people. Like I'll be like, oh, this part is going to, and like picture that, because it's so hard. Yeah. You're right not to talk to a mic and be or talk to a camera. Like, hi, good morning, everyone. You know, it's just a weird feeling. Yeah, it is weird. I found out apparently I don't blink uh, when I just am staring at a camera, and so that's. <laughs> Then the most feedback I get is they're like, do you need eye drops? It looks painful to watch you preach. Uh, Cause I just, because I, it's hard to not like, you would scan the crowd for your friendly faces, right? But now I'm just like eyes, uh, eyes wide open. So um, I will say that one of the things I love about the Hot Thoughts community is uh, that we get uh, kind of advice. And so I love this piece of advice. So each of you will take your bite uh, as the person before you is answering the question so that the burn is real and the burn is there. And so uh, so we will, from this point on, we will just go Rachel, Sarah, Russ, Matt, and we'll make sure uh, that you bite as the other one's talking. So uh, with that, um, Rachel, why don't you introduce your sauce and we'll go Rachel, Sarah, Russ, Matt, introduce what you got and then we'll take a bite and I'll introduce the question and we'll hop on through. So the next sauce that I have is a Thai chili sauce um, that mm. I, I want to do something that I would eat later. <laughs> and so a Thai chili sauce that's spicy. Good. Cool. Um, I actually am going to bring the heat down by putting on a hot sauce <laughs> because these are hot. So this is Chilua, which I could eat on everything. And this this Chalua was a gift from my friend's wedding. This was their like <laughs> thing they handed out. <laughs> representing That's outstanding. Them. That's really good. Yeah, Ross, what are you rocking crash. with? I would definitely crash that wedding if they're handing out hot sauce. <laughs> so uh yeah I'm I'm uh I'm still sticking with the Franks but I have moved up to the hot category. All right. Matt you got a shout out in the comments by the way but what sauce do you have? Yeah I see that. <laughs> I have a not talking face. <laughs> um, I've got so all four of mine are the same brand. There, it was a little four pack from Belize. It was a gift from somebody. So Marie Sharps, and this is the mild version. So, all right, that's what I got. Well, a mild have, habanero sauce. Oh, habanero. So it's gonna have something in it. So that'll be good. I've got the yeah. garlic reaper, which uh, Rachel, you'll get to later. Uh, yeah, but I, I'm not there yet. <laughs> so uh, as that goes, let's everyone take a bite. Uh, Rachel, everyone take, or Rachel, you take your bite first. Sorry, not everyone take a bite. No one take a bite yet, just Rachel. Uh, <laughs> and uh, here is your question uh, that you guys will have to think about, which is, this is kind of a moment in history where we can view it as an obstacle or an opportunity. And so my suspicion is you being here views as an opportunity. Uh, but what do you see as kind of the opportunity uh, that sits in front of us? And so, Rachel, when you're ready to talk, dive in. When Rachel's done, Sarah, put some Cholula back on there, and you can take bite number two. <laughs> well, you know, um, I think it's okay to um, see some of the challenges in front of us as an obstacle. I don't think obstacles are bad. Um, I think, um, you know, tenacity, faith, leadership is all forged in the fires of obstacle. Um, frankly, before this pandemic, uh, our church was in a little bit of a season of transition. We, we've experienced quite a bit of transition as Ginghamsburg Church over the last uh, 
probably two to four years. And so uh, super um, challenging obstacles in front of us. And I've just had to learn over and over and over again that every obstacle is an opportunity uh, to rethink, to reinvent, to, to really pay attention to what's going on in, on the inside of you uh, when you're facing those obstacles, um, uh, to not take it personally, and uh, to kind of grow and learn, learn through it. So for me, it's an absolute opportunity. I, I wrote this down ahead of time. I said, uh, we get to, um, I tell people all the time, this is our opportunity to tell ourselves the truth about ourselves, <laughs> mm. who we are, what we're doing well, and what we should leave behind. Who we are, what we're doing well, and what we should leave behind. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Uh, so Sarah, take a bite and it's your turn to dive in. What do you think, opportunity or obstacle? Yeah, I took my bite while she was speaking because I thought that they wanted the afterburn, which is actually more painful, if I'm honest, than the bite, um, which it usually is, right? Um, for us, I think, you know, for us as leaders, I think this is an opportunity for us as a church, um, Big C. I think what um, we were doing a lot of things, if we're honest, that aren't um, primary to the, the work of the church, um, the work of the people. So like, there's a lot of added on things that um, I think we're discovering might not be necessary. So mm -hmm. I'm in a, a group of lead pastors in my city uh, that meet once a week and I call it my men's group because, um, well, I'm the only girl. So um, <laughs> I have my men's That's meeting. Awesome. Um, yeah, there is there is another uh, lady who, um, she's on a staff at one of our biggest churches here, um, but she's uh, not one of the lead pastors. So. Um, and she only comes sometimes. So usually it's just me and a bunch of dudes. Um, but one of the guys was saying, you know, for them, like they're, they're a church that maybe you guys have come to to go to a conference because they're a huge church. I won't say which one. And he said, I hope that this is the moment we realize we don't have to be such a show. Yeah. Because nobody's yeah. going to miss the show because the show is available. Um, I'm hoping that it'll be the moment that we realize that, church really is that relationship people have with each other and that some of us as pastors will start to see that our um, job is really just curating and making space for other people to have relationship which i think is a big deal um for these like churches that a lot of us have gone to their conferences <laughs> to sarah's men's group you're welcome um <laughs> churches you know we've gone to their conferences to try to learn how to be like them and to hear them saying like no thanks um i think this is really right. an opportunity and for us to say, here are the things that we do really well. Like I got to joke around about, they're like, yeah, I think we're gonna do like small churches in people's homes. I'm like, his name is John Wesley. Let me tell you about him. You know, so I think it's sort of a return to some of the things that maybe matter. So I think it's an opportunity. I like the way Rachel said it. It was much better and had three points, but. <laughs> no, that was really good. Well, Russ, uh, what do you have to kind of piggyback on that? What's obstacle opportunity? What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I've got I got three points in a poem right here. So <laughs> just you know, thinking through this question. Uh, but on a serious note, um, recently I've had this quote in my head that I, I can't shake from a friend of mine. A guy named Ephraim Radner wrote it. And he said, despair over the church is the vice of modern Christianity. Mm. I started thinking about that a lot lately, just, you know, operating in a network that's often involved in helping people rethink yeah. things. And I found myself looking at this thing going, is it an obstacle? Um, it can be. I mean, if we, if we continue to try to like micromanage, you know, this, uh, you know, this obsession we have in a sense, we're trying to fix everything. I find myself going, man, why don't we just invite people to come rest in the one who's reconciled everything? Because mm. there's really something to revel in there. And so I don't, I don't really think it's uh it's an obstacle if we, if we embrace it that way. But again, if we, if we look at this as something we need to fix, then it, it will definitely become an obstacle for sure. Um, which that said, I definitely find myself leaning more towards it being an opportunity because the one thing that I found just the network, you know, pastoring in large settings before, and then with the network and traveling a lot from coast to coast, people in the faith often they ascribe doing so much to being, right? Yeah. Like the idea of like church is a place. And if you go and do these things and mark off these lists, well, then you were faithful, right? To the church. And I'll, I'm constantly finding myself going, man, if you would find the freedom 
to find that faithfulness to church activities is not the same as faithfulness in being a dependable friend to your neighbor. Mm-hmm. Like there's a real beauty in that and a real simplicity in that. And, um, you know, we could push and prod and shame people, you know what I mean, into running in it. But I feel like these last 10 weeks have sort of made, allowed people to sort of just find some rest in this, just find some rest in the reality of who they are in Jesus because of a deed and declaration of his, not theirs. Hmm. And I think the more we find rest in that, the more opportunities we'll have to just love people where they are. We won't, we won't be so obsessed with the doing in the name of church. It'll be a lot more just being. So yeah, that's my thought. That's good. Thanks, Russ. I think also like I think about like the difference between rest and inactivity. Like as someone that's a high level doer, like I, mm-hmm. I thought that 10 weeks off would be like, oh, I get a lot of rest. And like, I got like very little rest. Um, but like there is something between like finding rest and those concepts and even digging into some of the stuff you have. Like, I think that's a lot of what Jesus offers and what I think is cool. And so I appreciate you sharing that. And so, yeah. uh, Matt, what do you, I mean, what do you think obstacle opportunity? How has the gathering kind of been moving at this? Yeah. I mean, you know, I'll echo what some others have said. I mean, I think it's both. I think those things are the same thing basically. I mean, I don't know what an opportunity is if it's not an obstacle. I mean, that's just yeah. what it usually, how it shows up in my life anyway. Uh, so yeah, every obstacle opens up opportunity. So in that regard, I think it's both of those things. And, and I think that's an honest assessment from my point of view that it is an obstacle. It's hard. It's disorienting. It, uh, it comes with anxiety and uncertainty and those things are difficult. And that's precisely what makes it an opportunity. You know, a, a few, th- I would just share a couple of additional thoughts. You know, one is you know, I find it ironic. The church wasn't killing it before this obstacle. I mean, we weren't doing great anyway as a church. Right. Uh, uh, so I, you know, my tribe, the United Methodist Church, has been numerically speaking in decline since we started in 1968. So we were probably due for a good obstacle. I mean, we needed something different because what we were doing before wasn't working great anyway. So in that regard, yeah, it's an obstacle, but we, we sort of needed that. I mean, what we were doing before, you know, really was not was not great. So I think in that sense, it, I think it's going to lead. It, it can only lead to something better for us as a as a church. Um, I, you know, I also think about, um, you know, the, the way that this has, I think, caused all of us to to question where we put so much time and energy and, you know, really what is at the heart of the gospel. And, uh, you know, I just, I resonate with all the comments that have been made before. I mean, everybody who's involved in a large church or pastors, a large church, you know, you know how much energy and effort does go into the, you know, the big show on Sunday or all the, uh, the programmatic ministries that go on. And in some ways this has, freed me up to I've I've connected with more individual people the last two months than I I think I have in the past two years in my ministry and so it's just reminded me uh, of yeah. why I fell in love with ministry and mm. and probably where I need to push my time uh, I need to push my time back to to connection so mm. that that's been a, a positive and powerful reminder for me I think Maybe instead of obstacle and um, opportunity, I've been thinking about disruption. Mm-hmm. Like nothing, as I was thinking through like Pentecost, like that was a massive yeah. disruption, right? And so I've been thinking about um, God doesn't do much without disruption first. Um, and any movement that's ever changed has been a massive disruption and uncomfortable. Um, even like birthing a child, I've not done it, but I think Rachel could probably attest to it. The rest of you have witnessed it. Um, it doesn't look like it isn't a disruption. Um, it looks, you know, and I think um, it, it really does disrupt. Um, and I think that's sort of what is, what we're going through is disruption. And what we're letting go of in some ways is um, what I would call being comfortable. It doesn't mean necessarily we were in the best situation, Matt's right. We were declining, but at least we understood that. Um, We can't understand what's happening. And that's how we know um, oftentimes that God is involved um, is when there's a disruption that feels like 
you know, in my men's group, uh, just to go on with that, there was one guy uh, who's great. And he kept saying, so when are we going to be able to regather again? And someone was like, again, I'm going to tell you it's about the statistics, not about a date. Um, but, it, and, and I don't yeah. blame him. He's like, he's someone who's trying to love his people well. And so he was trying to figure out a way, like, how do I um, control a thing that's not controllable? And I think yeah. that's sort of, so when I think about opportunity and I don't know what it is yet, but I know it's a disruption. And that's when I know sometimes my job is to like, kind of let go a little and I hate it because I'm a doer as well, Danny, I can relate to that. And I'm like, so what do I do? And there, that's not the yeah. question in us. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's such an interesting, like just season to sit in. Like uh, for me, like I remember being at home for uh, what is now 10 weeks and trying to redefine even what it means to like be a effective and meaningful practitioner of the gospel, right? To like not say it's about uh, sitting in my office or shooting emails or writing sermons, right? But to say there's something different about what that looks like. And uh, I think disruption is really cool. And even looking at like the way church history has gone, like every 500 or what years, right? Like there's some major shift and we're overdue for something. And the Methodist church is, Matt, I think you clearly put out, right? Like we've been on the decline since day one, which is like not great optics. And so maybe we're in need of like some sort of revival and, and some push. And as I reach out to each of everyone, like I, what I appreciate about you all is like you guys are in varying sizes of churches in varying types of locations in varying types of ways you do them. But each of you is like, I would say like one of the greatest innovators in our country in your own right, because you guys are doing things that no one else is doing. Uh, and you're trying things uh, to reach the people that are outside the church because no one else is doing them. You know, they might be effective. And I just would be interested to share because there are people, uh, as Russ said earlier, like there's 70% of people that are uninterested in going to church as we know it. Right. Um, and that's not 50% of our population. That's nuns and duns. That's 70% of people that just say church kind of sucks or church is kind of scary and I'm not going to go. And so I'm wondering like for y'all, like, what does it mean uh, to be creative and like, how have you kind of been going about creativity? And so uh, I skipped the the sauce introduction because I'm loving our conversation. And so put some wings or put some sauce in your wings and we're going to reverse it. Matt, I want you uh, to go first and we'll end with Rachel. And so right. introduce your sauce uh, and why don't you dive into this kind of what is something creative you've been doing to kind of live into the opportunity or the obstacle of this season? I have to do so many things. I'm reading the comments. I've got introduced the <laughs> sauce, which is and then I have to answer something about creativity. Okay. My sauce is a grapefruit habanero sauce. It's wow. supposed to be hotter than the last one. Danny. So all right. well, I've got uh, the right. bingo maker. I'll do that. It's a good one. Okay. And then what are some creative ways you've attempted to cultivate community during the season? That's what you want me to talk about. I have to eat this first. You don't want me to eat and then talk. That's no. I want you, Matt. Here's the deal. Pastors are buttoned up. We want you to. We want you to sweat and then talk. We want to take away the buttons that the clergy have held for years and and sweat it out. All right. Well, <laughs> I don't know what any of that means. All right. <laughs> well, there, there's a there's a few things. You know, I, I made the comment last time that. Uh, we, I've connected personally with more people the past two months than I think I have in the past two years. And I think that one of the things we did, I don't know if it's creative, but in terms of uh, creating community is, you know, we've just tried, I've tried to write personal notes and we've made phone calls to every person or we've tried to, to every person that we have information for. Now, that's a lot of people for us. But what I love about this is I'm making these phone calls and I people are just sharing. First of all, they're picking up their phone. Well, that's unique. People never did that before. And they don't have much else to do. So they're just sharing like what's going on in their life with me. And I mean, this is not, not innovative. This is basic. But this tells you something about where the church and people like me sometimes get when we, we don't spend enough time just listening to the stories of people. And so I, we've been just doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one connecting. 
a lot of phone calls, a lot of handwritten notes. Hmm. We're fortunate to have a really strong small group ministry, and we've seen people return to those small groups and uh, the power of depending on one another instead of depending on me or a worship service or a, a staff. So, I mean, those are just some of the highlights for me. I am so proud of our community because, you know, people often say, especially about a new church that's led by the person who started it, you know, what's going to happen when, when you leave or what would happen if tomorrow you got hit by a bus? I don't know why it's always a bus, but um, <laughs> if you got hit by a bus, like what would happen to the church? And this has given me a little bit of a snapshot to say, you know, this church loves one another. And it, it's been a chance for us to to see if what we've been creating over the past 13 years will actually hold. And so um, we have a lot of people ministering to each other and, and that's mm -hmm. been encouraging for me. So those aren't necessarily innovative and creative, but they are ways that we've seen community explode during this time. I will say, Matt, like the one lesson or one of many lessons you taught me was when you have nothing to do, shoot an email or make a phone call. And I think that's what the gathering does really well, right? Like when there's right. nothing on the wheel turning and there's uh, nothing to plug in, like this thing's about people. And I think that's what makes the gathering such a unique community is at its core, whether it's uh, putting out really cool music or making messages, the gathering at its core has been about people, which um, cool to say. maybe you're right, maybe not super creative, right? But it is saying we're gonna do what no one else is doing to reach the people that yeah. people aren't reaching to dive into that. And so uh, that's cool. Russ, mm -hmm. uh, Russ, what about you, man? What are you kind of creatively trying to do? Cause you're even outside the box in general with the table network. And so what has that been looking like? Yeah, I mean, I wish I had some like really cool answer for you, uh, but <laughs> I don't. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, at times it's pretty shitty, man. During this COVID season, you spend right like 10 weeks locked up at home and to be to answer the question like what have we done to cultivate community like within like the table network I mean yeah there's phone calls like we've talked about there's emails um, there's been some zoom calls that people have done but the two things that I have actually found the most joy in during all this one is just cultivating community within my own family mm. um, I mean we're I mean we have a pretty intentional family we have our issues just like everybody else they're primarily other people's issues I mean I don't bring any of those to the table <laughs> but I'm kidding by the way if you're listening in on this um, but it's been really amazing just to to just spend an entire day right like smoking ribs and hanging out with my 3 year old yeah. and at the end of the day just sit down on the floor with him and be like we don't have anywhere to go and I love this yeah. It's just been, it's been unique. Cause I, I, I mean, I, I like to stay busy. Our, yeah. our theory in the table network is uh, <laughs> when you work, right. You work hard, you work fast. And when you're with people, you slow down. So when you take away all those times, right. With other people, all of a sudden I got to really spend a lot of time with the family. But, um, and I would say the second thing that we've done that I feel like is kind of simple, but could be creative in that, really just freed up everybody within the network and said, man, just spend time with the people in your homes or, right. you know, or you get together in a backyard and stand six feet apart with your neighbor that you probably never even met. Yeah. Feel right. no right. obligation to connect with anybody else here that already knows Jesus and is pretty content. Instead, use your time to hang out with your family or the people that are in and around you and the, you know, in the most safe ways that you can. And that's been, it's been pretty life giving to hear some of those stories of a neighbor that they had for two years. And it's always been kind of a, you know, odd situation, but now they're talking daily in the driveway. Yeah. And sharing a beer. And the conversation of Jesus has come up and I'm like, amen. There it is. Yeah. So. That's cool. And Sarah, I know for you similar, like you're kind of, you've been with theology on tap and places that are just, I mean, you're, I, what I appreciate is you're kind of like all over the internet on everyone's podcast, which I appreciate. And so even you being here, I appreciate you being on, but uh, like, I think trying to create spaces for people and um, just to go about that in so many different ways, whether it's kind of flipping your church or just flipping what church looks like, like kind of how have you been going about this to kind of be creative in this season? So I think, uh, I tried to be really creative in the start and we like made lists of like, do you want to talk to people with doing, uh, you know, texting each other? Do you want to call each other? Do you want to like, and we put everybody in groups, but 
Um, what I realized is that um, people are, are the ones who are doing a better job at creating community. And we have the opposite. Like if we call people, if I call someone, they're like, what? Yes, yes. Like they're so like, Californians don't answer our phones. Like we're like, this could have been a text right. if I'm honest, this could have been a text. Um, and I think it's, uh, I, I felt this real pressure to, I need to create community. But then I kind of stepped back a little bit and said that's ego that like really wants to be like, look what I have, you know, because I don't have a family. And so I, it's really hard for me to create boundaries around work time and rest time. And I didn't do a very good job in the middle of it. Like are in the start mm -hmm. of it. Honestly, I was working all the time and I, I can get to that again. It, that's very easy for me to do. Um, and so I've, I think some of the creative things I have done is just let people say, yeah, I don't actually want to go to community group this week. I do want to hang out with my family. And that's then the creative yeah. thing for me has been like, absolutely. Um, but right. one of the things that we have done, which has changed, I, it's, I think it's going to change the dynamics of our church is that we are actually, by the way, my little peanut neighbor is yelling. She's on my quarantine. So if you hear my name in a minute, she's just upset with her parents. Quarantine, um, just, that's good. I like that. Yeah. Well, you try telling a five-year-old you can't go upstairs to the neighbor that you play with every day. That wasn't going to happen. So they're like, we're a quarantine, which has turned out great because I didn't have hot sauce, as many hot sauces as I needed, and they had extra. <laughs> so um, one of the things I was going to say is that uh, we've opened our things that we thought were community, like our little community, up to the country. Guys, we have people calling from all different, like calling into our Zooms to do our theology on taps from all yeah. over the country. And they're connecting with each other, like, all, like not during tr like the call times. They've become actual friends. And so I think getting out of the way was the way that I was creative and said, all right, like, Here's the login, log in. And so people have, and that's been incredible. You know, I've I've heard of friendships that are like one person's in Seattle and one person's in North Carolina. And it's just this incredible way that, you know, the thing their their commonality is that the way they look at uh, their faith and who Jesus is and who Jesus may be. And um, we've had mm. some like really gnarly conversations that I thought would take months to build that like um vulnerability with each other, but I think this has created space for that. So mm. I don't feel like we've been super creative, but it, you know, again, it's just sort of shown up. Yeah. Well, also, I actually just got up. Was Cayucas. Go ahead. Yes, I like that. No, that's great. Uh, no, but to your point, I just got off the phone actually before we got on with a friend of mine. He's a rabbi in New York and he was saying that his like little borough of New York was where his like church came from. And now they have people in Seattle and the West Coast that are tuning in because it's just it's a, it's become a national and a global way. And I even know uh, Rachel, like at Gingersburg, we talked on the phone maybe a month back, and you were talking about that, like how you have people not just across yeah. Ohio, right? But you have people across the country, and you were even saying across the globe, they're saying, "Hey, we want to tune into what Gingersburg is doing." And so, uh, what has it been like for you? Like, how are you kind of leveraging creativity uh, and just kind of living into the season? Well, I think I have to brag on my team a little bit in this conversation, um, whether it's my family ministry team who are just doing the absolute um, most creative uh, things with families and children and students. Uh, just last night, we had a family trivia night for our kids ministry and just, you know, parents and kids getting on and winners, they get things like um, they're hand delivering like ice cream cakes from Dairy Queen. It's just crazy uh, the kinds of things that my team is doing just to kind of create this um, this fun, this community, uh, this online community. And my worship team, they're just unreal. This weekend for Memorial Day weekend, we had this piece at the beginning of our worship, uh, call to worship for Memorial Day and some remembering. And we had tornadoes, about uh, 14 tornadoes that ripped through the Miami Valley last year. And the way that they put um, that piece together, it would have it would have never had the same kind of expression in the room that it did online, and uh, just unbelievable. So uh, my team is just um, mm. they're really they're just really cool people, and they're super flexible. Uh, this weekend for Pentecost weekend, we um, I had this idea that I wanted to do worship by a fire pit because I'm pretty obsessed with fire. If you look at my social media, <laughs> I like, burn things every other day. And um, 
And so um, we were, we filmed about a week, uh, last week on Thursday night and it was cold and it started raining. And uh, I just previewed that piece today and it's just holy, it's just holy. And it's because uh, I have this incredible team of people that are just doing their best um, when they're, when they're a little tapped out, they're tapped out, but um, doing their very best in the season. So I love that too. Mm. The other thing is we're just embracing um, as individuals, kind of like, hey, some people on our team, they have kids racing in the background. Some people on our team uh, need a little extra community because they're single. Some people, you know, and so right. I think um, we're just embracing kind of the unrhythm of this season. Uh, personally, just this weekend, I went camping in my parents' front yard to social distance so I could see <laughs> them. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So, I mean, just thinking like, okay, um, I have all these questions I ask myself. Uh, what could I, what can I do today that I couldn't do without this season that I'm in? What can I do today that I couldn't do before? So. Cool. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for sharing those and we're kind of we're going to transition into a portion uh where everyone gets to ask y'all questions and so i kind of i try to give you guys stuff to at least think about uh kind of rubrics for hey here's the conversation but where the fun happens and where the the spice really hits its apex is in uh questions that we can't prepare for and so we're gonna take a moment and just let people uh kind of throw questions in that they might have and uh, while we do that, um, <laughs> Matt, I see it says, are you low key dying? Are you dying? Are you doing okay? I'm doing great over here. I'm reading <laughs> the comments. I'm listening to great <laughs> stuff from you guys. I'm eating wings when I'm not on air. This is great. This is great. Well, hey, so for the first question and, uh, Russ, I'm just going to throw this one for you uh, to start. And so uh, the question is this, uh, kind of where have you seen God lately? Uh, like this is, even in that opportunity question, um, we do know that God is in the midst uh, of the mountaintop and the suck. And so where have you seen God in this? And I'm gonna tell you real quick, this, I'm new to the podcasting hosting thing. This is super unprofessional. You're in my earbuds, I'm gonna hear you. I have to go to the bathroom. And so I'm gonna mute myself, but you guys talk while I do that. And you guys keep the Yeah, that was extremely awkward. And uh, just kidding. He'll hear that when he comes back or when he watches it tomorrow. <laughs> However this works We can do out. whatever we want now. We really can. So that's a uh, question is, uh, where have you seen God lately? And I'm going to kick that up to you, Rachel. And you just fire away. I'm totally kidding. I'll answer it. I see that you're enjoying your wings there. But, uh, yeah, I think that's a great question. And for me, it's been uh, – Man, I think it's it's a little bit of a of a of a tense a tense moment of seeing him. But where I have been seeing him is just really finding finding rest in the middle of what we're doing in this crazy season. I mean, I know it, for us it wasn't near as difficult uh, as a network and what we do in regards to like when I'm you know led in a conventional church you know setting with all the responsibilities that go with that. But I have definitely been finding uh, moments of stress as you're trying to think through and work on things and prepare for what you know what we're what we're doing right now and where we're going. But even in the middle of that, finding some rest, some peace, I guess you could say. When I say rest, that's what I mean, peace. Mm. And just knowing, yeah. like, man, he uh, he he is present. Period. And no matter what's going on, no matter where we're at, and nothing here is taking him by surprise. And so in like these stressful situations, it's been cool to just sort of find some peace that, that I didn't conjure up or didn't get by some discipline, right? And just in a sense, like you just, you just fall into it. That's been good. Uh, yeah, that's good. Hey, I thank you for uh, taking over hosting. And for those in the comments that are wanting, I did in fact wash my hands. Uh, and not not I'm not sure that it was two happy birthdays, but it was at least one and a half. Uh, and so, hey, Sarah Heath, we got a question for you uh, and everyone. And so I want to go Sarah, Matt, um, this one. Uh, what's something that's made you cry during this season? Like what has been hard? I know for me, uh, I uh, just kind of sat in the middle of 
my living room the other day and I just started like crying thinking about the fact that I hadn't gone to the like the church building because for whatever reason I had this sentimental like feeling and I was like you know what I didn't want to go there for a long time and now I'm like I'm crying because I'm not in the lobby shaking hands and hugging people and I'm just such mm -hmm. a physical contact guy and like got caught off guard and started crying about it and so for the two of you uh what's maybe something that's either church-wise or personally um from Mel McCagney what's what's hit you hard during this season and um, well this Kaifa sauce just made my eyes water and made me sweat um but I um I had I had that day I think all of us have had the day where um you are crying um, and and all of a sudden you start naming everything that's happened since the start of COVID as the reason. And my poor mom, I was calling her and I was like, and then this happened and this happened. But the reality is what I was crying about is the weight that I felt um, because as our governor um, has said that people can start to gather in like um, ways that are different. And I just, all of a sudden, um, when you're a new start pastor, so we're in a really weird transitional time um, what made me cry was just sort of the weight of um, trying to care for what I would consider the least of these. So some of our mm. folks that are higher risk, also the weight of I have loved this you know community into uh, into being born in some ways. When you do a new start, it takes all of you, and um, not being sure that uh, I was making the right decisions. And I think in a weird way. Um, it also answers the first question of where have you seen God? My leadership team that is so new, guys, like we're talking like we let you know, like nominated everyone and then they're like COVID. So like we just are trying to uh, get to know, you know, how our leadership stuff is going to play out. And for us, we've got all this financial piece as well because we're on grants and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I hate to be the pastor is like and the money has been showing up, but like for us, that's that's a big deal because we're not in a very lucrative, you know, we're we're brand new in some ways. Four years at a church is a, even though the church itself has been here since 1912, um, and we've got some folks that feel like they've been here since then. I'm just kidding. But um, oh. because we kind of merge both the old and new, I, it, it, there's this sense of like, um, it just felt like so much. And I cried and I, because I am someone who um, doesn't have a family, it's, it's hard. And I'm really far from my actual family. My family doesn't live anywhere near me. And so like my parents and such. So it's, I think that is what has made me cry. And then I'll say another one is um, pastorally, what's been hard is, you know, a dear friend who's also a member of our community had to put her dad on hospice and she's younger mm. than me. And what does that feel like? And, and I can relate to trying to do that kind of community care um, is really hard to do when you cannot touch somebody. Mm. Yeah. What about you, Matt? What's been hard kind of going through this? Oh, gosh. Um, sharing, you know, trying to work in a house with three teenagers. There's been days that's made me cry. Um, <laughs> I think in I'm pro probably in all to be more serious. Um, Talking to all the, all these people, as you know, I said before, I've had the chance to do just hearing real stories of pain, literal death, um, people being sick, uh, people losing their jobs and real fear over what their future is going to look like. Uh, yeah. And I've I've only literally cried once, you know, and. Uh, one of my friends and a pastor who lives right near me, whom I get together with a lot, died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I just cried that I couldn't, there was really not, not much that I, I could do. And uh, that's the one time I literally cried over this, yeah. uh, over this break. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's hard. The whole, the concept even is not just pastors, but as friends, like having to navigate losses. That's one thing we've even mm -hmm. had to navigate is we've been to funerals for family and friends, which is interesting to think about. Like you don't think about how much they happen in the normal scheme of life, but in 10 weeks, it feels like they've come so rapidly. And 
Um, and then you feel like you can't do much. And so I get that, Matt. And uh, thanks for sharing that. And so, um, yeah, great. Rachel, for you, you kind of have a different question. So I'm going to, you're going to wrap us up with a different question uh, to kind of transition us, which is just this. Uh, what do you not want to add back when COVID comes back or when we're back in, in space? What are you not excited about seeing uh, put back in when the restrictions are lifted? Uh, I know for me, like uh, I'm a physical touch guy, but I, I will do without on requested hugs. I'll, I'm great without that. And so I don't know. What are you looking for? Uh, to not be a part of when church comes back? Well, um, I'm looking forward not to going back to a seven day a week schedule. Um, yeah. Sabbath has been a really important part of this rhythm for me personally, and I think for our team. And so uh, we're trying to figure out ways in which we can do uh, ministry and life differently so that everybody has at least two days a week uh, where they're not doing um, and so we just really, I've just committed myself. I just feel like it's wisdom for the long haul um, to looking at what we've been through and saying the mm. only way that people are going to be able to spend time with other folks, um, neighbors, strangers, family is if they have time to do so. Mm. Yeah. yeah, no, that's good. I think the, I've read a lot of uh, Carrie Newhouse stuff over the last 10 weeks. And it's just interesting, like the idea that like the church office, as we know it, uh, maybe never should have existed and that we've kind of found the ability to release into something that might look a little different. And so um, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. And thanks for Matt and, and Sarah and Russ for sharing kind of your questions as well. And we're going to head into the last one. I actually don't know if I made you guys have a, a sauce on that last one or not. I'm not hundred percent sure. So skip then to whatever your last sauce is. Uh, and for me, I have the last dab redux, 2 million Scoville units, friends. I might die. It's going to be bad. Uh, but Rachel, what do you have? I have the uh, Widowmaker, the Dingo Widowmaker sauce. <laughs> Which is, for those wondering, that's like 680,000 Scoville units. So that's no joke. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good luck. Matt, what do you got? Uh, mine's only 250,000 uh, Scoville units, but only that's the... a lot. All right, well, I'm going for it then. That's that's what I'm doing. It's the hottest of the Marie Sharps lineup here. <laughs> well, 250,000 made me cry last week on this show, so you're oh. in good company with that. Well, so, Sarah, what do you got? Well, what's concerning me is not what I got, but the picture that they used to display, like hot is down here, friends. And then it's past that on the pepper. So I'm, mm. you know, it doesn't have Scovilles, um, but it's it's apparently a lot of a pepper. So this is the uh, jalapeno pepper hot sauce from Trader Joe's. I'm the most California person, guys. I have all like... <laughs> You're just rocking TJs for everything. I love it. That's amazing. Um, what do you got, Russ Johnson? I got some sweet Thai chili with a habanero sauce. All right. And, well, uh, here's what we'll do. Uh, we're going to – billion, Ru One billion Scovilles. One billion. That's off the charts. Yeah. Well, here's what we're going to do, Russ. Because you're rocking one billion, why don't you take your first bite, and then we'll dive into this question. Uh, and uh, describe for me, friends, your hope for the church. Uh, 2030 is an arbitrary date, but what do you think – what do you hope the church – a decade from today looks like? Does it look the exact same? Uh, Y'all talked about the show. Does it look like the show? Sarah, you talked about Methodism. Are we looking like John Wesley and the circuit riders back in the early days? Like, what are we doing? And so, uh, Russ, kick us off. 2030, uh, based on kind of the, the shifts we're going through, if you could just hope, what do you hope the church looks like? It might have to pass. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And this is why I do this show. This is the only reason. Yep. <laughs> this is my favorite. I got to get better at this last question. What I should say uh -huh. is anyone who wants to start first can start first is what I really need to start saying. This physically hurts. <laughs> my teeth hurt. <laughs> I didn't know that teeth could hurt other than like if you have a cavity. My teeth hurt. <laughs> the back of my mouth is on fire. 
Yeah. I'll tell you, yeah. this isn't my favorite sauce I've ever had. It tastes a lot like pain and a le lot less like flavor. Uh, I'll be honest with you on that one. It's going to hurt tomorrow. I just need you guys to know this. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Uh, um, I really yeah. like this Widowmaker sauce. <laughs> well, well why don't you, uh, Rachel, because you like it and will give me enough time to take my earbuds out and take off my hoodie, why don't you answer that first question for us? You know, um, I thought a lot about this um, in terms of uh, just where kind of I, where I hope that uh, the faith community that I lead is. Uh, we have kind of a 10 year vision that says no child within our reach goes to bed without faith, family or food. And uh, I just think about being the kind of community that really does uh, lean into that vision in such a way that uh, now it's getting hot in my mouth. <laughs> um, <laughs> it just took a while. Um, being like where people come mm. to church um, because they feel safe to come here. Like, and mm. I don't just mean the, the building. I just mean they gather uh, together because this is just safe space and they want right. to invite their families and uh, and their friends and their neighbors and their strangers. And I hope that we start recognizing uh, the real connection between being a church gathered and being a church scattered. Um, mm. Like uh, I, I do think people are really, really tired of the show um, I'm not saying that the show is completely gone, but I just think people are really, really tired of the show and authenticity and vulnerability are so important in this season. And, uh, how can we, how can we really live out the gospel, proclaim the gospel, um, in ways that people, people see it, they see it and they say, um, I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of that. Yeah, now yeah. my lips are on fire. <laughs> Good. Well, hey, Russ, Russ, have you come back to the land of the living? What do you got for us? Yeah, man, I got a lot of wisdom to expound on this one. And uh, that's sarcasm again, just in case you guys were wondering. And, uh, but no, seriously, uh, 10 years, you know, what do I hope to see? I think there's a lot of ways that we can look at this, you know table centered spirituality. Amen. That becomes the norm. Mm. Like the church would literally become synonymous with everyday broken people passing on God's boundless love around a table where everyone belongs no matter what. Right. Like that to me sounds pretty freaking amazing. Um, so yeah, I definitely have a longing to see that, you know, 10 years out. And one thing I would say probably in conjunction with that that I would love to see is something I've been doing for a little while now and helping with and working with established churches, church plants, is one of the things that I was training early on was you create an assimilation process. I know you guys know this for our audience that might not. You've got these people that are in place that kind of help people move in to become part of, right, the church family. Right. And, you know, you're moving them towards, you know, giving, serving, right, community, all these other things. Amen. Love it. But one of the things I found was that the whole key to success was close the back door. You need an assimilation process that closed the back door. And I've looked at that over the years and went, you know what? I think probably the one of the most effective things that we could see happen in the future is a church that creates a formation process that opens the back door. Hmm. And now when I bring that up, sometimes church leaders think like, oh, I don't want to do that. Like we could lose our jobs and we'll lose our building and everyone will leave. And like, that's probably not going to happen. Because you live in the West, and 30% of the population is a lot of people. And so you're constantly going to have people who know churches, right, from this more formal, centralized idea. They're always going to be coming and checking things out and plugging in. You're going to be having people move to your cities looking for a church family, and they know, like, what's, you know, conventional church, and they're going to be coming. So to me, it's almost like it's never – I don't think that's ever going to go away. But, man, mm. what could happen if you had a formation process that raised up the people that had a heart for those that won't come? where you can intentionally really turn yeah. and just go be the church in and around where they're at. I mean, to see that like in a 10 year, a 10 year span would be pretty amazing because you would have an intentional approach for not just reaching the 30%, but you'd have an intentional approach for reaching the 70 and 70 mm -hmm. and 30 is everybody. Mm -hmm. So 
yeah, that's, yeah. that's what I hope to see. That's awesome. And I would say like just getting a chance to run with you for a little bit, Russ, like I've appreciated uh, the whole reason I actually started this whole thing was for the the concept of the 70%, right? Like this is like, how do we engage? Like we have kind of pastoral <clears throat> spheres that of the people we know, but what's really interesting is like we, I'm a hand talker, Sarah, uh, but we have our people <laughs> outside of us, right? That, uh, that maybe don't go to church. And I had a, mm -hmm. After our last episode, I got this text from someone that said, like, hey, uh, like, someone I'm with, like, doesn't go to church. And, like, they're just really intrigued by the idea of hot sauce. And they stuck around for the conversation about why Jesus matters, right? And if we're not attaching faith formation and kind of the, the truth of the gospel to a church, like, that is really an interesting concept. Like, how does the church look? Uh, and, Russ, we even talked about this the other day, like, in the first century letters, right? Like they don't own properties, right? Like they're not writing letters to physical churches, right? Like these are people that are just doing it around tables. And so that's- Yeah, Israel's not, <clears throat> Israel's not renting out their synagogue to you on Sunday because they're not using it. If you're saying Jesus is the Messiah and Rome's not giving out building permits to anyone who's not saying Caesar is Lord. So yeah, you've got this very ragtag movement of people and you've got meals. Yeah. Hopefully some good drink to keep everybody sane. Um, <laughs> right. And amen for it. So I think, what, you know, if, if you hear anything I'm saying is I'm high fiving anyone that's in a conventional church setting. Love you. Love what you're doing. Man, keep going at it. How can we help? And at the same time saying, but there is an intentional way where we can also really pursue this very massive group of people around us by just getting pretty creative with a very <clears throat> ancient approach to following Jesus. Mm. You don't have to kill one to do the other. That's kind of what I'm, that's, yeah. that's, to see that really come to fruition in 10 years would be pretty, would be pretty badass. For me, I don't yeah. know yeah. a phrase better than that for it, so. That's okay, I'll just say gnarly a lot. Um, I actually, uh, I, I would like the church to look like Queer Eye. Um, and by that, I mean, I would like the church to look where people who are radically different can be together because the U.S. is not a place where that happens right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And churches are, you know, we used to be, and in, in some ways are still incredibly segregated. Um, so what would it look like for churches to look like the kingdom of God? Mm. Where I am, and, and that's something we talk about in our community all the time, because I look around and go, this makes no sense why you guys hang out other than the kingdom of God. Because when I was... Right. learning about church planting it was figure out your audience and then go straight for it and that's not the kingdom of god and until we learn how to be like something like queer eye where people who you know they let their differences down so that they can be together and have a common purpose and goal i just think i don't know why churches um exist if it's not going to be the thing that helps heal this massive um, I mean, my gosh, guys, how can a pandemic be a um, political topic? Yeah. And yet it has been. And church leaders aren't helping that. And so how do we see that uh, Jesus was able to bring such radically diverse people together? And that's my hope is that because we're having this massive moment where everything is so blah, 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 can church, instead of being the most separated, be the thing and like, for us in my generation, we, a lot of us don't live near our family. So church is a place where I get to hang out with people who are a lot older than me and people who are a lot younger than me. So what would it look like uh, to sort of reclaim mm. the space of, of being great with each other's differences and, and like having tough conversations and still being okay instead of, oh, yeah. did you not see that this is what we believe here? And so, you know, kind of understanding that we're all on a spectrum. And I agree, I think mm. there's this, beautiful thing about we got to stop just wanting our brand to do well and start mm. seeing it as like, like we are one brand as in humanity. So mm. that's yeah. good. Well, that yeah. Thank you for that, Sarah. And uh, Matt, letting you close up, I would say like, just to throw it out there, like you got quite the shout out. Like someone said they had tears in their, and I wish I could see who it was, but tears in their eyes. Cause they feel like the community that you've been able to cultivate at the gathering is exactly what Sarah uh, and, and Russ uh, and Rachel and myself have been describing it. So just for you uh, and having a chance to work with you, like I would say like the gathering 
is an outstanding place to work. And so I don't know that it has to look radically different, but you do have the opportunity to say like, what does it get to look like 10 years from now? Like, where do you hope things go? Yeah. Uh, well, that's very kind. We have a long way to go as a church, but that's a kind comment. Uh, 2030. I hope we're back being live by 2030. I think we might, <laughs> might be there. Uh, we're not making any promises. Uh, I'm going to rapid fire this because there's a lot of things that I, I would love to see uh, for the church and for the larger culture that the church leads and pre- participates in. So I'm just going to go go to it. I hope we have more diverse leaders so that the church looks more like the kingdom of God in my city, especially. Um, this past week, I just was haunted by watching the video of uh, George Floyd's death in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And, and I hope by 2030 that uh, things like that are history in the church yeah. is not silent, but leading the way and speaking out and, and part of the, the deep uh, confession of sin and, and salvation that our country needs around race. I hope we're younger. I hope our churches are younger. Uh, I hope LGBT folks are no longer uh, a reason for church folk to argue and fight, but they're just fully welcome in all levels of, of leadership and participation in our churches. And that can be uh, another thing we read about in history books. I hope we fight less. I hope we're more culturally humble. We just have more humility that we uh, take our seat back at a table, speaking to culture, but not needing to be at the head of it. Uh, Just just taking a seat maybe in the back row and uh, and chiming in. Uh, I you know, I hope that we're messier. I hope I hope the church is a messier place because the people in it are not folks who've been there a long time, but folks who are curious and just coming to check it out. I hope we're a more generous place. I hope that we um, use our resources in ways to transform the world. Uh, And I hope we surrender more to Jesus. Ultimately, I pastor a lot of people who have a lot of gifts in their life, uh, a lot going for them and they come to church, but I'm not sure they've really surrendered to Jesus. I don't know if they know that they need him very much. Mm. And I, I hope that we, we see more surrender to Jesus so I could keep going, but I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah. Those are just some of my hopes for the church. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I mean, I appreciate just the for you, just taking uh, what was supposed to be an hour and now is an hour and almost 18 minutes <laughs> out of your night uh, and uh, just hanging out and talking about this. And uh, because I think what is exciting is that there's four leaders like you guys uh, and you women like leading the future of the church. Like you, y'all are the people that are going to be really pushing, I think the envelope of saying, how does it look different? How do we engage people? And how does that 70% of people that don't want to go to church and the 50% of the people that haven't heard the story uh, and just haven't clung to it, how are they going to engage? And so I appreciate you guys just engaging. And uh, I don't, usually we just kind of end with a goodbye. Uh, And I hope everyone joins us. Next week, I have what is my covenant group on uh, next week, which I'm really excited about uh, just to talk through some of this stuff. But I actually just want to close in prayer. Uh, One of my really good friends uh, who was actually on our first episode of Hot Thoughts, he lives in Minneapolis. uh, And Matt, I would just say like after uh, kind of you bringing that up, uh, there's protesting happening around him just after uh, the killing of George Floyd and, and all of that. And we know that it's just such a tense time. And for him, like he's someone that is just at the front lines of fighting for equality for, for all uh, <clears throat> and trying to hope that brutality ends in all ways. And um, I just kind of want to end and just pray for people, not just in Minneapolis, but people across um, just our globe that are fighting uh, against the injustices of, of race and gender uh, and inequality that stand up. And I would say, the biggest thing that fights against people joining our church is simply that, that like the gospel doesn't look like freedom and equality. And sometimes it's preached as inequality and injustice and being able to preach something that looks a little more like, um, I think Matt or or Sarah, as you said, the kingdom of heaven here and now. Right. And so uh, I just want to pray for us and then uh, I'll I'll bid everyone adieu. Uh, But friends, if you're with us, uh, maybe you just find yourself a posture of prayer 
uh, and pray with us. And, and y'all um, just join me just in kind of a moment of prayer as we pray uh, to close our time up. So, holy God, we uh, I just thank you for each of these leaders, for Rachel, for Sarah, for Russ, and for Matt, um, for just sharing their their heart and their their soul, um, the ways that they've cried and the ways that they've celebrated about the future of where your Holy Spirit is leading. And I appreciate each and every one of their leadership uh, in this season because they are leading uh, on the bleeding edge of, I think, where your church is going. And we are so thankful to have leaders like these four scattered across your country. And so we lift them up and just pray uh, a hedge of protection over them that they may lead with, with courage and humility uh, and just guidance from your Holy Spirit. But God, I also know that we have friends uh, that are just fighting injustice every day. Uh, I, I am painfully aware that the group of people that I'm surrounded with looks a lot like me uh, when I look at the color of my skin and knowing that there is a need to elevate folks that don't look like me uh, to these conversations uh, because not only are they leading the cutting edge of the church, uh, but they are just dying it on just staggering clips for for no apparent reason. And God, we just lift up uh, each and every one of those people and communities of, of color uh, in marginalized places and cities uh, that are disenfranchised. God, we pray for those people and knowing that uh, your Holy Spirit may transform those areas and give them protection. But God, we know that internally our hearts need to be radically shifted uh, to be the change uh, and to live out the gospel truth in this world. And so we just pray for the five of us, uh, for the hundreds of people that, that watch this, God, for the people that are outside of us, God, that our hearts would be changed, uh, that we might be the truth of your gospel in every breath we breathe and every step we take uh, so that this world looks more like your kingdom here and now and less like the division that the tempter tries to breathe into this world. And so, God, I pray specifically for my friend and all those uh, that are in the riots right now uh, or the protesting or whatever is happening in Minneapolis. God, we just pray that uh, you're with the the uh, those out there on the streets, uh, that you're with those that are the officers, that they would have wisdom and guidance and those that are protesting uh, would have courage and boldness and wisdom as well. Um, and God, we just pray that you were in that space and that your Holy Spirit would actually transform us because we believe that it can. And so God, I thank you for this night. Uh, for spicy wings and spicy conversation, for just four amazing leaders uh, and for the hour that they contributed. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. I forgot how close I was to the camera while I was praying, uh, but I appreciate you guys sticking around for that whole thing. Um, well, hey, I appreciate each and every one of you being here. Uh, Rachel to Russ, in that order, does anyone have a final thought they want to add before we close out? <laughs> a final thought um keep doing things like this uh i think it's really important for us as leaders to be listening to one another um matt i think matt's exactly right there's a humility to all of this and uh we need each other's voices so keep it keep at it yeah matt you got anything for final comments for us Oh, if there's pastors listening, just I'm praying for you. Give yourself grace. We've never done this before. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, read 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It's held me up. It might hold you up as well. Yeah. Sarah, you got anything for us? Yeah, I think it's just um, incredible to hear um, how the spirit is moving all of us in sort of similar directions, even if we're, it's looking differently. And so um, even in the midst of it, you know, I echo what Matt said, you're doing enough and uh, we aren't, we aren't responsible for getting everything in alignment. Um, but we are kind of in a place where we do need to be listening to more people um, on the margins. And so, um, yeah, especially this week, a lot of people are in pain, so be listening. This has been a very painful week for a lot of people. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Russ, you got final word. You got something for us? Mm. And I would echo everything that's been said. And, uh, yeah, thank you guys all for, for sharing that. So the only thing I'd probably add to this is, you know, maybe a, a different name for your podcast. Like, <laughs> like hot, hot videos. Videos yeah, <laughs> I'm thinking of, I'm, I'm bringing TRL back. There's things that are easier to Google. 
you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, I actually uh, love it. Keep it going. Yeah. Seriously. I love the show. I love yeah. what you're doing. Love the heart behind it. Echo what everybody's saying. It's been a good night. It is great. It is really great. Yeah. Yeah. Good job, Jenny. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it's okay. you. Don't pee, though, in the middle of it. Maybe you don't pee in the middle of it. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, I'll be honest with you. I, uh, I just, it was a bad, it had to happen. I'm so sorry. Uh, but I appreciate you guys for being here. My covenant group is on next week. Uh, Trista, Mark Sheets, Evie. It's going to be a great group. Uh, I will actually be in Florida doing it remote, uh, which doesn't matter because all of this is remote. And so I hope that you guys tune in to join us for that next week. Uh, the four of you as well. And uh, friends, thank you for joining us. And Hot Thoughts people, we see you next week. All right. Bye, man. See you guys. Good to meet you.